and our next speaker is Tip Hudson. Uh, Tip Hudson has worked for Washington State University Extension as a rangeland and livestock management specialist since 2003. He previously served two years as the director for the Washington Cattlemen's Association. At WSU, his outreach efforts has focused on sustainability, rangeland grazing, ecosystems, monitoring, protecting, or improving watersheds health through smart graze, grazing practice. Tip is a certified professional in range management. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Rangeland Ecology and a Master of Natural Resources, both from the University of Idaho. Tip is a native of Arkansas Ozarks. Today, convinced that range and pasture-based livestock production is the most sustainable form of agriculture, he works to help meat and fiber producers improve their ability to achieve the triple bottom line, economics, environmental, and social sustainability. Tip. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sounds like this is not. I think we got it. It is going to work. Well, thanks for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. I did get into range line management. Uh, because I was interested in managing whole ecosystems for the benefit of people. And I had done an internship when I was in high school in Arkansas with a wildlife biologist working for the Corps of Engineers. And I discovered that uh, after I got to the University of Idaho, that's not going to work, is it? After I got to the University of Idaho, I discovered that uh, rangeland ecology was more what I had in mind namely a, a, a discipline that integrated a bunch of other disciplines to manage land well for, uh, for food and fiber production. And this is still what I find to be motivating, that if we have a way to produce food and fiber that doesn't obliterate whatever was there before we started growing food and fiber, it seems like we have some obligation to try to do that well. There's a, a natural synergy between ecology and economy in rangeland and pasture-based livestock production that I think really is unique and that we should be proud of, even if you did obliterate some of what was there and then planted other stuff. Uh, so my job as a range extension specialist is to help people manage land well. And, and people whose livelihoods depend on managing land well, because we're ordinarily trying to avoid spending a lot of money on, on external or agronomic inputs in rangeland and pasture-based livestock production, uh, I think is important. And the older I get, the more I'm interested in caring for people, because people are the only way that, that we uh, can take care of the earth. Well, a group of us at WSU had gotten a grant about five years ago to do some short film documentaries on ranches in Oregon, Idaho, and Washington who were managing for what we called uh, climate resiliency. And it was our uh, observation that most of the things that we should be doing on rangelands that had the potential to increase resiliency against climate uncertainty were the sort of things that we should be doing whether or not the climate is changing. So we called these no regret strategies. Uh, but my role in this, in this group was to be interviewing the rancher while they're on camera, and most of them are nervous, and my job is to ask questions that, uh, you know, follow rabbit trails and, and try to milk them for whatever information they may have that we haven't uncovered yet. And I really enjoyed doing that. It felt like it was productive and, and that we could, uh, we, could, we could handle a topic in much more depth in conversation than either of us could working on it alone. So I got a grant from the Western Center for Risk Management Education uh, to start a podcast, and my big idea was just to interview people that had useful things to say about rangelands management and livestock production, 
and release a, a one-hour interview every two weeks. Uh, that's why I've been doing that since October of 2018 now. I had really been enjoying it. In a address by Nathan Sayre to a group of range specialists back in 2005, he said that ranchers consistently identify sociological and regulatory risks as the most significant and unpredictable and uncontrollable uh, risks in ranching. Uh, specifically, he said, the threats to ranching today are not fundamentally ecological ones. The forces arrayed against it are economic and social in nature. He goes on to say this is what typically keeps people up at night, not whether or not to buy uh, feeder hay after you sold your good hay or where you're supposed to graze tomorrow. These are complex social and economic and ecological problems that require, uh, that require solutions that you can't really address through, say, a financial planning workshop, although those can be useful. But the, the, the point is the problems are bigger than that, and they don't have uh, sharp edges to the problems. And for some people, these, these risks, which is pretty sterile language, pile up and combine into a nonspecific general sense of anxiety. And like in state and transition models for ecosystems, avoiding crossing that threshold in the first place is typically much more useful than trying to recover once you've passed it. Uh, I don't know what the situation is like here, but in much of the Northwest, where there are big farmers that have big financial risks, uh, we actually have a pretty significant and alarming rise in farmer suicide. Uh, in fact, episode 59, if you haven't listened to the Art of Range podcast yet, is on uh, farmer suicide prevention, and I would encourage you to listen to it. And if you know somebody who you think is at risk, say something and find out what kind of help is out there. So in, in scientists speak, we might say that these social and regulatory risks have to be addressed by continual adaptive management toward ecological and economic resilience. But... Uh, those words really don't quite communicate the amount of work that it takes to translate that concept into daily decisions. And even more basic than that, uh, training your thoughts and your moment-by-moment -moment actions toward doing something creative and constructive. Uh, but doing that requires building mental and social skills that increase your ability to respond creatively and constructively to these kinds of challenges. And that mental ability and resiliency is being challenged. Thomas Friedman, who is a fairly well-known New York Times journalist, uh, called our time the age of interruption back in 2006, 15 years ago. And a former Microsoft executive called the dominant thinking pattern today as continuous partial attention. Uh, brain scientists have shown that the human brain is highly plastic. A neuroscientist at George Mason University says that the brain has the ability to reprogram itself on the fly, altering the way it functions. And this, is, this phenomenon is known as Hebb's rule, uh, cells that fire together, wire together. We can gain and lose specific kinds of mental abilities depending on what we do with our brains. If you've noticed that it's more difficult than it used to be to settle into a book and read left to right, at a comfortable pace, without your mind wandering or even your eyes jumping all over the page, then uh, you're experiencing the effects of immersion in the internet and other digital media. Unfortunately, uh, this scattered thinking and inability to concentrate are probably just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Sherry Turkle, uh, who some may have heard of, is a social scientist who's been at MIT for 30 years studying the effects of computers and digital technologies on people. And she has argued, among many others, that a more serious long-term result of our immersion in the digital world is, is a lack of sympathy or empathy for fellow people. On the one hand, there's nothing new under the sun, but I would also argue as we come off the backside of, or what's hopefully the backside of several COVID surges around the country, a situation that has often pitted brother against brother in our individual responses to it, uh, as well as uh, lots of other significant social dysfunctions right now that the, 
the volume of this uh, antipathy, this antipathy, is much larger than it used to be. And I, I, it's in a way that we sense is dangerous. Uh, that, and this antipathy, which is not just a lack of sympathy, but, but an active disregard for other humans, is agnostic to political party, age, gender, ethnicity, and occupation. It's not an us versus them problem. We begin to counter it by face-to-face, -face unhurried conversation with others, and by forming thicker relationships, and by treating other people as if they're valuable because they're human, not because they subscribe to the same news feed as I do. And I think one of the, one of the things that I was hoping to counter with a podcast that records conversation is that we, we tend to forget that information is not wisdom. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien said that true education is a kind of never-ending story, a matter of continual beginnings, of habitual fresh starts, of persistent newness. Uh, in extension, we like to talk about lifelong learning. There's this assumption that we never fully arrive, that there's always something more to learn. And in fact, after doing both marriage and rangeland ecology for over 20 years, I have a lot fewer pat answers than I did 20 years ago on everything. And I think I've come to believe that that's the beginning of wisdom and not the end of it. Nicholas Carr, in a book called The Glass Cage, which is about the social costs of automation, describes uh, pretty well what happens when we give up the ability to think, when we give up pursuing wisdom, and we are just uh, collecting scientific facts. He says, if we're not careful, the automation of mental labor by changing the nature and focus of intellectual endeavor may end up eroding one of the foundations of culture itself, our desire to understand the world. Predictive algorithms may be supernaturally skilled at discovering correlations, but they're indifferent to the underlying causes of traits and phenomena. Yet it is the deciphering of causation, the meticulous untangling of how and why things work the way they do, that extends the reach of human understanding and ultimately gives meaning to our search for knowledge. If we come to see automated calculations of probability as sufficient for our professional and social purposes, we risk losing or at least weakening our desire and motivation to seek explanations, to venture down the circuitous paths that lead toward wisdom and wonder. It may be a lofty goal, but my hope with the art of range is to venture down those circuitous paths. Temple Grandin was the keynote speaker for the Society for Range Management, uh, I want to say maybe 2015, at a meeting in Sacramento. And she was really taking to task a bunch of scientists who tend to uh, disregard the observations of, of real people who are working in the real world and assume that nothing is true unless they can prove it quantitatively with double-blind controlled scientific studies. And she made the case that what people are observing is real and it's our job as scientists to believe that it's real and find ways to try to understand causation but not to disbelieve every single thing uh, that, that other people observe over years and years of immersion in the real world of things. A conversation is important because conversation is extraordinarily powerful. It's the most human thing we do as humans. It also strengthens the brain because it demands single tasking, doing one thing with some focus for an extended period of time with your brain fully engaged on that one thing. And this is becoming frighteningly rare. But a conversation also promotes what psychologists call the generation effect. This is where you're, this is like animals eating food. You take in food and you digest it. You break it down into individual parts and then the body resynthesizes what the body needs from all those parts. Uh, this is how we generate knowledge and wisdom, not by just having access to a bunch of facts where we have instant retrieval, uh, but in digesting information and doing something with it uh, that's unique to our own context. Uh, Fred Provenza, who some people may know of, is a fairly well-known researcher of animal behavior and herbivore interactions with the environment. And he said, the process of creating in science and practice is enabled through dialogue, the free flow of ideas among peoples of diverse backgrounds. Uh, Don Nelson, who was Washington State University's 
range beef specialist for uh, a lot of years, like to say that we don't know what we don't know. We uncover some of those unknown unknowns through conversation. Uh, one of my favorite interviews was with Dr. Provenza. I think it's episode four. We're on 74 now. Uh, but you can, you can listen to Dr. Provenza at artofrange.com or even better by subscribing to the Art of Range through your favorite podcasting app. Rene Descartes was the one who famously said, but in Latin, I think, I think, therefore I am. Uh, but we really are not just thinking things. We are thinkers, but our behavior isn't really driven, at least not only, by rational analysis. Our ability to think abstractly separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom, but our actions are driven by what we love, what we want, by our vision of the good life, we're always moving and living toward the thing that we love. And so it's important to give some thought how we shape what we love. Things like music, literature, friends influence our thinking in whatever direction. There's a, a good quote from a musicologist in Athens from a very long time ago. Speaking of the influence of music on human emotion and behavior, uh, he said, let me write the songs of a nation, and I don't care who writes its laws. The main point here is that we're persuaded to action by an appeal to shared values, not just a transfer of scientific facts. And even those of us who are paid full time to do education have to be willing to try to persuade and motivate and not just communicate individual facts. This uh, may not be exactly what you were expecting from a talk on a range podcast, but I, I guarantee you if you listen to the podcast, there's a whole lot of science there and good conversation. Uh, but I have some, uh, some simple take-home messages that really do represent a convergence of cutting-edge br cutting brain science, good philosophy, and what used to be called common sense. Talk to your neighbor. Talk to your family. Talk to somebody who knows about... Uh, range in pastures that maybe you don't know yet. When you're talking to somebody, uh, leave your phone alone. Attend to the real live person in front of you or on the line, and it's not quite as easy as it sounds. It takes some, it takes some effort. Then instead of watching the news, which you can't do anything about anyway, uh, <laughs> go do something else that's good for your brain. You can go fishing, build something, read a good book, go for a walk, Go for a ride in some place you don't really have any practical purpose in going to, and your brain will thank you, uh, your children will thank you, and your grandchildren will thank you, and that is worth quite a bit. Uh, and turn on the art of range the next time you're driving. It won't be nearly this philosophical. It'll be about topics that are related to uh, what you do for a living. I'm not sure where we're at on time, but I, I wanted to keep some time for questions. Uh, you can, before I forget about it, I'm not very good at promotion, so if, uh, if you haven't listened before, take a listen, and you, can, you, can, you really can search for it in whatever your podcasting app is. Search for The Art of Range. Somehow the the part seems to be important in the search coming up, right? That's probably because there's only 3,000 people listening and not 3 million, but... Uh, the Art of Range will make it come up on whatever your favorite podcasting app is. Or you can listen directly off the website at artofrange.com. Okay, Questions? right here. Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> and we're going we're gonna to take questions. Okay. Are there any, is there any specific topic that you get a lot of questions on? Is there anything that people are Yeah, that's a good question. I listen to podcasts by subscribing through them through a podcast feed instead of on a website, but I have found that individual episodes that have been promoted, say, by the organization of the person that I was interviewing tend to get more listens, and so the number of listens doesn't seem to necessarily have any correlation with interest in a topic. It's more whether that got promoted through another organization or just, you know, whatever the average uh, downloads are. And, of course, the stuff that's further back has more listens than the stuff that's more recent. So it's hard to say. Have there been any that people have engaged more with? Like maybe you followed up with you 
Yeah, I think I've had more, yeah, more follow-up phone calls or emails from uh, topics on grazing management. The one with Fred Provenza was about animal behavior and plant <coughs> secondary compounds and how, uh, you know, this animal select, uh, you know, micro portions of their diet when they have a wide diversity of, of plants around, they'll select, uh, you know, individual plants and plant parts that are a really small percentage of diet, but they have significant effects uh, essentially as a natural pharmacy. Uh, that topic with Fred was a good one. Uh, Any other? Yeah. Yeah. Through your question and answer process with these different producers and range managers, I'm sure you go through the whys to a hesitant to say adopt regenerative type practices or as I bring people or try to attempt to bring people into that idea and I'm met often with more resistance than it seems, you know, that it should be. Have you come to any conclusions through that question and answer process? Are there resistance to that? Yeah, maybe some. I, I, there is some resistance to that. Uh, I think some of that is academic. There's still an awful lot of people saying that it doesn't make any difference, but uh, but the people that are on the ground doing it can show that it, it makes a difference. And I, I think to some extent, you know, the set stalking rate folks in academia and the regenerative folks are talking past each other. I'm not so sure that it's, you know, a, a, a huge difference in, in science. But uh, at least in the West, some of that reluctance is that there is the perception that doing uh, more intensive grazing requires infrastructure that, that isn't cost effective based on the amount of landscape that you're trying to cover. You know, I'm, I'm working with a, a rancher and several agencies on a 25,000 acre collaborative grazing project near me and 25,000 acres isn't all that big. You know, there's 5,000 acre individual pastures that the animals are only in for three weeks and, and you know, three weeks is about the right amount of time. So there's, I think there's a, a gradation. You know, we can, I think we can have uh, what I would call regenerative grazing without doing one hour moves with a 100,000 100, pounds animal, you know, per acre. Um, and for many people, you know, just anything other than grazing for eight months on the same piece of ground is going to be an improvement and will make a difference. Uh, but, I, but I think, you know, seeing the difference after people try it is really what changes minds. Okay, right. Okay. Yeah, I mentioned that it was funded through a grant from Western RME. Uh, to get the grant, I had to uh, promise or at least project, you know, several categories of topics. And so I'm generally trying to stay within some categories of topics that I thought would be compelling for a review board with the RME, which is mostly producers. Uh, but it tends to be more opportunistic. You know, I've, the list of people that, uh, that you could interview is miles long. and. Uh, so partly I'm looking for a topic and sometimes it's just I become aware of somebody that I think would be a, a really interesting interview and so we go with it. Uh, so it's a combination. Some of it's planned and some of it is uh, serendipity. Okay, right here. Okay, we're going to take this last question. Sure. Can you concentrate on any one region of the country? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm in Washington State, and but we have uh, many people may not be aware that the east side of Washington State is sagebrush desert. So I live in Ellensburg, which is eight inches of annual precipitation. Uh, the west side of the state is wetter, but, but because, of, because of my background in rainland ecology, my goal is to cover lots of different ecosystem types and climate zones within the country. And so a lot of, I think most of the content would be applicable nearly everywhere. And some topics that are maybe more specific, such as seeding after fire, uh, still have general principles that would be applicable to a pretty large chunk of the country. Okay, right here, we want to, um, we are finishing up a few minutes early. <clears throat> so if you all would like to stay and ask some other questions, they will be around. But we certainly appreciate all of you for coming to this session. And we really, really appreciate you speakers, you all have done an outstanding job. 
So we want all of us to give them, give them another hand.